One class of uh, models for Oreo special cells are the continuous attractor networks. And they are based on neural fields as we know them from dynamic neural field theory. So imagine we have a layer of neurons. So this is a whole set of neurons. Neighboring neurons have positive connections and distant neurons have negative connections. One can visualize this um, lateral interaction kernel with sort of in this way, which indicates that the neuron where this kernel is centered has local excitation that is sort of indicates positive values and global inhibition indicated by these negative values. We know that if we have a sheet of neurons that are laterally connected with this connectivity and you have a certain dynamics, that this field will develop one blob of activity. And please note that this blue line here indicates the connectivity for one particular unit, but all the units share the same connectivity, so you just shift this kernel left and right. And what you then have is a local blob of activity somewhere, and typically they're not two blobs of activity because of the global inhibition and the blob of activity locally, the units cooperate due to these local excitatory connections. So there will be one blob of activity, but that can be at any location because the connectivity is completely shift invariant. Yeah, so this is what we know from dynamic neural field theory. Now what we do in order to model head direction cells is we take such a sheet and we connect it to a ring so we have sort of a dense set of neurons i only show a few of them around same connectivity and then we have a blob of activity riding on this ring and this this blob of activity is free potentially free to move to the left and to the right now, if we manage somehow to move this blob of activity at an angular velocity that corresponds to the angular velocity of the red, then if you record from a single neuron, so let's say you record from this neuron here, as the red runs around, this blob would run around. So for a lot of angles, this neuron would not be active. And then as the red points in this direction, uh, this neuron becomes active because the blob moves across this one neuron. Yeah? So we sort of switch between two different pictures here. So the one picture is we see the ensemble of neurons that can be arranged in a ring with this blue connectivity. On that ring we have this blob of activity and that moves left or right on this ring as the red rotates left or right. And if we record from this one neuron, so if we were to record from this pink neuron, then we would measure a tuning curve that looks like this, right, as a function of the angle phi. Okay, so, so this here indicates the angle and the activity of a single unit, while here this is a, the sum of neurons and this is, for one particular orientation, the blob of activity. Well, this goes across all orientations. Yeah? The question now is, how can this blob be moved um, according to the head velocity, head angular velocity of the red? We've learned in the sort of um, physiological part that there are head uh, angular velocity uh, cells uh, that fire as a function of the angular velocity of the red. Now the particular architecture that is proposed here to move this blob around looks as follow, follows. So we have a set of helper units. And I now visualize sort of how you would move the blob uh, so in this direction. So this set of helper units, they receive input from the main units and they project it 
to the neighbors. So you have this kind of a connectivity. Yeah? And you can imagine, uh, so if the blob is here, this unit, this unit is active. This activates this helper unit and that propagates this activity to the neighbor here. And so we have this blob of activity here and through this sort of shifted feedback, this area get actually gets input and this area does not get input. And that makes this blob move in this direction. If you have another set of neurons, which are similar, just projecting to the other side, yeah, you can also move the blob in the other direction. So as the red turns in one direction, it activates the pink helper unit so that the blob moves in the one direction. And as the red rotates in the other direction, it activates the blue units, which then turn the blob in the other direction. If everything is tuned right, um, the blob can be made to turn as fast as the red rotates based on the um, angular head direction uh, velocity cells. Now this is the idea how you get head direction cells. The cell, uh, the, this idea can be generalized to place cells and to grid cells. So for place cells, we can actually go up here again to the original image. So if you um, take, so this is sort of a, a 1D plot of a place cell, you could imagine in a linear track. So here again, you would have a set of helper cells, right? which are with asymmetrically feedback the activity that you have um, either to the left or to the right side. Yeah. Something like this. And you also have the blue like here. So then activating the pink cells would make this blob of activity move to the right side and activating the blue set that I've not drawn would move it to the left side. And like here, you can then draw a picture where this now is um, the position of the red. And if you record from a single cell, uh, as the red runs back and forth, and along with the red, the blob moves back and forth, then you would have a signal, sort of the, this particular neuron would fire around that location. It would be quiet. The other locations, because if the blob is on this side, then this unit, of course, will not be active. And this then would be a place field on a linear track. And it's fairly easy to imagine that you could also have this in 2D. Yeah. With lateral interactions. The only trouble here is that now you need... Uh, so while in the one D case you only need these helper cells for one direction and for the other direction, so you have two sets, here it's a bit trickier because you have potentially all kinds of directions in which the red can run. So um, you actually need you know, a whole set of helper cells that uh, can move the blob of activity to the upper right, to the, uh, to the, to the bottom, to the top, etc. And for that it's helpful to have, have these head direction cells because that would determine in which direction the blob should move, right? So the head direction cell uh, can indicate sort of which, in which direction the blob should move and then sort of the, the um, path integration signals, so, so the motoric signals, so how many steps the red makes would indicate by how much it should be moved. So here we see head direction cells can be modeled that way and place cells. Now, for grid cells, we need to change the lateral interact, uh, interaction kernel here a little bit. So I again show a um, 1D example. So again, we have the neurons here. If we now take an interaction kernel that has local excitation as before, but only mid-range inhibition, so it looks like this. 
Yeah? Then we know from uh, field theory that the pattern that emerges is actually a set of blobs. Roughly, um, so this, this depression part, so the local mid-range inhibition part determines sort of the distance between the activity blobs. So let me draw it here. Something like this. So there's, there are multiple blobs of activity on this sheet. And now again, with this technique of sort of uh, activating feedback that goes in the uh, one or the other direction, again, you can make the whole pattern move either to the left or to the right, so it will coherently move. And now if you record from a single cell, as this pa pattern moves, yeah, imagine the red moves from one end to the other, and along with the red, the, these blobs move. If you record from a cell, since there's now a whole, since there's now a whole set of um, blobs, sort of one blob after the other will pass through, and as the red runs from one location to the other, this one particular cell would be activated, then silent, then activated again, then silent, etc. Right? So you would get, would get this kind of pattern. And this is a 1D version of play cells. Now again, you can generalize this to this two-dimensional structure. Uh, and then, so the top view on this sheet would look as follows. And that's interesting. So you have now... So this now is sort of a continuous version of this uh, 2D sheet that I've drawn up here. And the blobs of activity will actually form a hexagonal grid. And that's a very generic um, pattern formation result. So local excitation, mid-range inhibition, and you need the right nonlinearity leads to a hexagonal pattern of uh, blobs. If you now do the shifting by the asymmetric feedback through either the pink or the blue se uh, set of neurons, actually in 2D you need more of these sets, but you can imagine that by asymmetric feedback you can make this pattern move, but the whole hexagonal pattern will coherently move and if you then record from a sing single neuron here, uh, you can imagine that as the red moves, the pattern of blobs on the sheet move, and then it looks like this particular cell will fire on a hexagonal grid. So you, the hexagonal distribution of place fields in a grid cell would be a consequence of this hexagonal pattern formation in this two-dimensional sheet. Now, what complicates matters a little bit is the fact that you have borders here, yeah? so that they would, so the, the blob maybe doesn't want to move out of the border because the local excitation uh, um, doesn't support this blob anymore. So this is this can introduce border effects. One way to deal with that is to suppress the activity gradually towards the borders. Then you would have clear bumps of activity, blobs of activity only in the middle and then they would fade in and fade out, uh, fade in from the border and fade out towards the border. So this is a model where you have multiple blobs of activity on a sheet, on a neural sheet. The neural sheet itself is, is really 2D, has a 2D a topology with some borders. Another way to deal with this is to actually um, use this type of model, or actually is sort of starting from the heterection uh, um, uh, model, but interpret the sort of the dimension along this circumference here not as a heterection but as a location. And now you can imagine if you move this blob on this ring as a red moves, then it will repeat itself. Right? You get exactly the same pattern um, if you 
rotate multiple times. So here we have confined the rotation from 0 to 360 degree, 60, 60 degrees. Um, while here we have just kept going, and if you would keep going here, it would actually repeat itself, right? You would, would get multiple patterns. So this would happen in 1D, so you get the 1D analog of grid cells. But you can also do this in 2D, and you achieve this by sort of um, taking a... taking a square. I mean, here we have gone from the 1D model with two ends to the ring model by gluing together the two ends. Now, if we need a two-dimensional model and we still want to glue together the ends, we, have the, we can sort of glue together the one side with the other side. So these are bound together, right? And these two ends are bound together. And this will give rise to, to a torus. And now I try to draw a torus. So it's sort of it's a torus structure. I hope you can. Imagine this somehow. Um, and as the red moves in space, if we, I mean, we have just one blob of activity. Let me again take green. We have one blob of activity here, in contrast to the model that we have discussed earlier, where we had a whole set of hexagonal uh, blobs. So here we have just one model, which, because we use local excitation, global inhibition rather than local excitation mid-range inhibition, as here. And as the red moves around, depending on the direction, this blob now starts to move. Now, because of the cyclic boundary conditions, as it moves out of the, out of the, the square here at the top left, um, it will automatically move into the um, square again from the bottom right. So it will move like this. If it moves in this direction, right, it will disappear here and reappear here. So now you can imagine if you record from one single cell in this sheet, let's say here, and the red runs around, the blob keeps moving on this in this square, but if it disappears at one corner, it reappears at the opposite corner, that then you get a continuous sort of a repeated pattern of locations at which this particular cell will fire. So again, we have sort of two different pictures. So the one picture here is, this is the sheet of neurons, a lot of neurons, and we're just looking at one time point, uh, and we see that this group of neurons is active. Um, and if we now plot this in a real sort of 2D environment, yeah, we might see that the cell fires here, and as the red runs around, the cell again fires here. Yeah? And that is a consequence of this blob of activity first moving across the cell that we consider, and then disappearing on one end, reappearing on the other end, and then coming back again um, to this particular position. The trouble with this particular model is that it would actually generate a square pattern. Yeah? Because we have a square, we glue together the right and the left side and the bottom and the top, and then we get a tiling that would look like this. Yeah. That can be fixed very elegantly by not gluing together the bottom half, bottom part one to one with the top half, but by twisting the two lines. So how can I draw this? So, um, so if you, if you need to change the aspect ratio a little bit.
and that would give rise to such a tiling. Yeah? So now here we have glued together the top right part. Maybe I can color code this. The top right part with the bottom left part. Yeah? So if I disappear in the top right part, I reappear in the bottom left part. Yeah? So it's, it's shifted. So the right part is shifted by half a width of this whole sheet size. And the lower right part is shifted to the upper left part. Yeah? And that gives rise to a hexagonal pattern. Yeah? Because if, it, let's say, a cell is, uh, we record from a cell here in the middle of our sheet, um, and now we sort of, because due to this tiling, we sort of overlay the tiling of the sheet and the space, right? So like we here, we had this one tile, and we have put the, the, then we have introduced the tiling here. I could actually introduce this here as well, right? So here the tiling would look like this. So then we have sort of the neural sheet repeated very often and overlaid over the space that allows us to consider both aspects simultaneously. So if we have a neuron that sits here and the red runs around, so the blob moves up, uh, this cell will respond again if the red is here because it's again the same cell where the red is. And it will respond here and it will respond here, 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 and here, right? And now you see that we have this um, hexagonal pattern of place fields due to this twisted um, torus topology. So if you if you go back to the torus, you can take the regular torus uh, as generated from the square. You can cut it off at one position, you rotate it a little bit, and then you glue it together again. That gives you the topology that you need in order to um, generate this um, grid cell structure with just a tiny with just one blob of activity. Now, there's, these two models look similar, but they're sort of different in the sense that this one here has only one blob of activity, while this has multiple blobs of activity. And here, the hexagonal sh uh, structure of the place fields results from the way we have glued the ends together into a twisted torus. Right? So we could also generate a square lattice. While in this situation, the hexagonal shape results from this local excitation mid-range inhibition structure, which naturally gives rise to hexagonal um, structure of the place fields. So it's actually quite different. A bit like a side note, I wanted to mention that you can also generate place cell responses from grid cell responses. I said Side note, because I don't really believe anymore that this is done this way, but for the sake of completeness. So imagine you have a number of grid cells. And you have a whole bunch of them in different... in um, different resolutions. Then you can imagine that if you linearly combine their responses, that you can produce a place field response. So an activity just at one location. So how do you do that? One way is you, you go to that location, so which would be this location, let's say, or this location. And you simply take the weight by which this grid cell feeds into this place cell proportional to the activity of the grid cell at that particular location. So this grid cell would not respond, at least not much, to this place cell, while this would respond significantly. 
Now, if you imagine you have a whole ensemble of such grid cells, um, some will have their place field at that location active, or will have a place field at that location, some not, and you sum only over those which have a place field at that location, then all these grid cells will add up at that location, but because they have a different spacing, they do not um, add up at other locations. And that leads then to a single place field at that one location. So this would be a very simple way, just having the weights that feed from these grid cells into this uh, place cell proportional to the activity of the grid cell at that location. There are a number of learning rules that can do this. Competitive learning is one, applying sparse coding or independent component analysis. They all lead to sort of a transformation from the grid cell representation to place cell representation. Now, sparse coding, that's maybe quite intuitive that it performs this uh, because uh, this representation has a few locations at which the cell responds strongly and a lot of lo locations where uh, the response is zero. While here, so depending on maybe 30% of the uh, locations, you have a strong response and maybe 70% you have weak response, but that is less sparse. Yeah. Actually, you don't need grid cells for all this to work. You can have any random distribution um, with sort of some spatial uh, low-pass property, and it will do, right? So it does not depend on the grid cell uh, topology that you can generate a place field from this. Um, yeah. for, for instance, you could take all the grid cells and rotate them in, in space, and then, of course, there would still be linear transformation that would, would produce place fields, but the grid cells would not like, or the, these components would not like, uh, look like grid cells anymore. So it's very easy to produce from grid cells in a linear way place cells, um, but it's a question whether it's sort of plausible that, that the place cells are directly generated from grid cells. There's not, not too much evidence for that. A very different type of model is the oscillatory interference model. So here the idea is that you use uh, somehow neural oscillators. Um, there are different theories about where they come from. So, uh, And you have a base oscillator that oscillates over time. And you have another oscillator that, that has a similar frequency, but it changes slightly. And I will go into the details how it changes how it changes in a moment. So, but if you imagine that it has a slightly higher frequency, then you observe that in the beginning, the two oscillations were aligned. At this location, the two oscillations are in antiphase, and at this location again, they're in phase again. Or here they're already in phase. So, and what results is if you just add these two oscillations, you get a sort of a strong response first, then it might not be perfectly aligned, but I, I hope you get the idea. Then it gets sort of less, and then it starts to get the amplitude gets stronger again. And you see that there's an envelope that has a large amplitude small amplitude and a large amplitude again. So this phenomenon is known as a beat. Superimpose two oscillations with slightly different frequencies. You hear these warm, 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 warm kind of, this is in the acoustic domain, you would hear these. You can use this, for example, to tune your instrument. Yeah? If the strings are slightly out of tune, you, you hear this um, wow, 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 kind of thing. Um, and if they're exactly in tune, then you hear a very nice steady sound. Now, if you now imagine that these two oscillators, neural oscillators, are added, this is the activity, let's say, of the memory potential or so, and then you have a threshold of firing that is here. Yeah. Then whenever the oscillation crosses, 
you will have a spike, something like this. So you will have a spike here, spike, maybe I'll take a different color. You have a spike here, spike here, spike here, here, and here. Um, so that's the basic phenomenon that we need. Please note also that the time of spiking changes slightly depending on whether you have a large amplitude, it comes earlier. Um, if you have a small amplitude, it comes later. Um, so this phenomenon is used to model phase precession with this um, model type of model. Now, if this were not time, but if, but if it were space, um, then we actually had sort of this one-dimensional analog of a grid cell, right? So it would just repeat. So it would fire here, then it would not fire, then it would fire again, etc. So how can we make this axis to be um, yeah, a spatial axis? So now I need a little bit of math for that. So phi of t is a phase, and that's related to frequency by integration. So we integrate from 0 to time t over 2 pi, and then frequency at times t dash dt. Yeah? So, um, yeah. so if, you are, if you have a high frequency, uh, then the phase progresses fast. If the frequency would be zero, then it would not progress at all. It would just stay where it is, so no matter how you integrate further. And you need this 2 pi in order to translate frequency, which is sort of uh, um, 1 over second, into uh, phase, which is here measured in terms of 2 pi. Now let's assume, I mean, we have one fixed frequency. This was our baseline frequency, this baseline. And we have a modulated frequency, FA. So now imagine that our FA changes over time, is the base frequency plus some factor beta times velocity as a vector, so in 2D, times a direction vector. And so this is... Um, okay, so we need later on, we need a couple of them, that's why there's an index i here. I should actually also write an index i. Okay, let's do it. Let's put an index i here as well, so that we can have uh, several frequency modulated uh, oscillators. Now, if we calculate, so we can calculate the frequency of the base oscillator with this equation and of the frequency modulated oscillator, we have the same equation. And if we now, and we see here that the amplitude of the superposition depends on the phase difference. If the phases are aligned, that means if the phase difference is zero degrees, then the they interfere positively, constructively, to a very high amplitude. And if they are opposite phase, 180 degree phase difference, then we have a minimal um, amplitude. So the magnitude, the strength of the response depends on the difference between the base frequency and the modulated frequency. So we calculate this phase difference. Okay, so this is the difference between two, two um, integrals, and we can take the difference actually into the integral. So then we would have from 0 to t, t 2 pi, f a i of t minus b of t, And if we now plug in this definition here, we see 
that this fb cancels with this fb. This is fb of t, but which is a constant, right? So this is constant because that's the base frequency. So we just are, we are just left with this term here. And now we notice that 2 pi, beta, and di are all constants, so we can take this out of the integral. So we only integrate over, well, this, by the way, is also a vector. Um, so we, since everything is a, is, a, is a constant except for this velocity vector, um, so we take the integral only over the velocity vector, and what is velocity integrated over time? Well, that is position. Right? If we assume that the position at time t was 0, this then simply is um, 2 pi beta x of t times di. x is still a vector, this is a vector, and here we assume... Um, x0 to be the 0 vector. Yeah. Now, this is a two-dimensional um, position. And this is a two-dimensional vector. So what we do is we have a fixed di that might point somewhere. And then we have the position somewhere. And at any given time, so we have an x vector. Um, so what this phase difference tells us, it tells us the position projected onto D, right? So any position along this orthogonal to the D vector would give the same phase difference. Yeah. That means if we now go to 2D and we have our vector di in this direction, then whenever the red is um, along this line, the phase difference will be 0. Along this line, phase difference might be 90 degrees. Right. 180 degrees, 270 degrees, that's supposed to be green here, and then 0 degrees again. Yeah? Now, this determines or characterizes or um, represents the position only in one dimension, and the other dimension is completely uh, um, invariant. So this would sort of be not a hexagonal pattern, but this would be a stripe pattern, sort of a wave-like pattern, right? So you would have high amplitude at zero phase differences, so at these yellow lines and uh, sort of minimum uh, amplitude of the firing, so zero, zero firing that would correspond to this location at this blue line. In order to make this um, a hexagonal pattern, you need another vector, and it's sort of suitable to take three different vectors. So this then would be d1, d2, d3. Okay, now it's a bit of challenge. No, this should be... So these should be at 120 degrees, so this is not quite right here. So that's three. So now let me see whether I can draw this. Yeah. 
Okay, now I don't want to confuse this image too much. But you can imagine, I mean, here you see for, for the pink lines, it's easier to see because there's the yellow and the green, difficult to distinguish. But for the um, yellow one, you see this triangular pattern here. And there will be another pink line here. And there will be another pink line here. And another pink line here. And now you see how this hexagonal pattern starts to emerge. I, I show this with a pink line. So let's assume pink is zero phase difference, which actually it used to be, was supposed to be uh, the yellow line, right? See how the... Yeah, so here you see the hexagonal pattern structure that emerges, right? And um, so, strictly speaking, I think you only need two of these vectors, but it's more robust if you have three. It has, gives, adds some redundancy to it um, that can be also used for error correction. Um, if you only have these three oscillators, then you will notice, I mean, there's one location where the three oscillators agree here in, on the pink lines. And there are also locations where the, uh, the other frequencies agree. So you could have sort of, it would be ambiguous where the, where the grid would actually be. So you really need this baseline to pick out one frequency. Uh, and that would, in this case, let's say the baseline fires at the, or oscillates at the phase um, of the, uh, at the pink phase here then at the pink phase, the baseline oscillator would constructively interfere uh, or add up with the three oscillators that all sort of by their own would just produce a wave. But if you superimpose these 120 degree rotated um, waves uh, on top of each other, then you get uh, this hexagonal pattern. It's... I should add and emphasize that this is now not really space, right? If the red would not move, you would have just two oscillators oscillating at one location. Let's say you're at, at the zero phase position where the grid cell fires maximally. Then you would have a zero phase a difference between the two oscillators. I'm back to in the, in the one dimensional picture. Now, as your red moves, the oscillators uh, continue oscillating, but one becomes a little bit faster if you're going in the right direction. If it's going in the other direction, you're, the oscillator becomes slower. So, and then at, at this location, so, so they continue uh, oscillating, and one is a little bit faster than the other one. And then if you're in the middle there in enter phase, and if the red stands, so that they would just continue in enter phase, and then if it continues go, the one actually again becomes a little bit faster, and then they're in phase again. So they're continuously oscillating, but the phase changes according to the position. So sometimes they're oscillating in phase, and sometimes they're in enter phase. Here they would be 90 degree off, etc. And that gives rise to this beat pattern. Yeah, so this is the oscillatory interference model.